The games that have got me really excited over the last sort of last sort of six months or so are really ones that feel like a sort of like I said, like a passion project of one person where you can almost like hear their voice in it. And um, it feels like someone is really trying to make a game that does something that they've never quite been able to do with with other games. Um, as a kind of contrast to these games where sometimes you'll read through a 300 page book and you'll think, I, I don't know what this person wants me to do with this game. Hi, welcome to the Daiku Podcast. I'm Gary Snow. I'm joined today by Chris McDowell from Bastion on Press, who has created what I would consider a foundational tabletop role-playing game, Into the Odd. And then he went on to fine-tune this design philosophies in the wildly popular Electric Bastion Land. Chris, it's a pleasure to have you on the show today. Welcome. Pleasure to be here. And so, Chris, um, I know that we want to cover a lot of uh, your more recent game designs, but maybe you could just tell us a little bit how you got into the game industry in the first place or how you started in role playing. Yeah, so, um, so I mean, I think it's, uh, it's kind of a common thread for people in the UK um, to get into RPGs uh, through sort of Games Workshop, really, which um, by the time that I was, I was sort of getting into Games Workshop, they didn't really do RPGs anymore. Um, they'd moved fully into the kind of the miniatures side of things. Um, but from when I was about 10 years old, I kind of got obsessed with that whole uh, Warhammer side of things. And RPGs and D&D &D was this kind of thing that it, I knew existed um, sort of on the periphery of this. This would have been sort of the mid 90s. Um, but without like the internet to sort of go and just dig into it, it would always this, it was always this kind of mysterious thing that existed that I sort of knew was out there. But I couldn't buy it in a games workshop, so it might might as well have not existed <laughs> for, for my purposes. Um, so it was always this kind of mythical thing. And then I sort of eventually got into, I did have a brief sort of uh, exploration with uh, Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, which I very much enjoyed reading through. And I love that book, but I never really quite managed to sort of run it properly. Um, and then eventually sort of, when D and D third edition came out, that was the one that I kind of got me into RPGs uh, properly, and um, and yeah, fr from there, um, from my sort of mild dissatisfaction with third edition, I kind of found the kind of OSR and like the indie game side of things um, that was that were going on, and sort of went sort of fully into that really, and um, and yeah, so like you said, I designed a couple of games and. Um, I've now been full-time designing games for oh, it's just over two years, actually. Um, it was uh, just at the start of um, 2020 that I did that. And I would say that's probably everybody's dream that kind of gets into the role-playing space of if they're going to be designing games. And you mentioned uh, mm. like the Google Plus days. And would you say that was kind of the, the, the foundation learning grounds for when you started to explore like how to design games and like bouncing ideas off each other? Yeah, so in the Google Plus days, it, it sort of... Because because the thing is, I didn't really have a nostalgia for old D and D, because like I say, it was this thing that I kind of knew about, but I didn't like know the specifics of like how basic D and D worked, and I'd I'd never played like, you know, Holmes basic D and D or anything like that. So um, the the thing that drew me to like this sort of the this sort of OSR community that was growing on Google Plus was the creativity. It felt like everyone that was involved was was playing these games. But they were also making stuff and everybody had their own kind of version of the game everyone was doing little house rules people were thinking about why the game worked the way it did and sort of how to actually run the basically anything you could think of people were like making it felt like it was this huge creative uh, kind of explosion really um so i kind of got drawn into that thinking well if everyone else is doing it you know obviously this is something that uh, would be fun to try out um and yeah it, and it was a big contrast to what I sort of felt to my experience with third edition, which was I had these three, you know, the big, three big, huge third edition um, hardback books. And for me getting into RPGs at the time, it felt like that was like the Bible. And like, I couldn't really touch <laughs> it um, in terms of like changing things. And it felt like, well, everything I need is in here. So I don't need to really think too much about what I'm doing. Um, whereas if you're just pulling bits and pieces from, you know, dozens of different people's ideas, uh, it felt like a much more kind of, collaborative creative kind of place so yeah that, that that's what kind of got me started in like sort of 
making games that I, I that I thought people might actually want to play. <laughs> Were you doing it uh, in the fantasy genre, like the elf and uh, fairies, wizards, and yeah? So, so I kind of start. I, I mean, I've. I'm trying to think back. So I, I, I'd i been like tinkering around with RPG design sort of before I found G plus a little bit, um, kind of in a very kind of standard fantasy kind of way. Um, and yeah, the, the sort of game that I'd made, it, it's, I, I sort of cringe looking back at it now, but the game that I'd made kind of before Into the Odd was very much like a, I'm going to replace D&D because here are all the things I don't like about D&D. And it's like, well, I'm just going to make a better D&D and everyone will love it. And <laughs> Yeah, it, it had its flaws, but um, it, it was the it was the classic like um, game of that kind of style, um, and it never got any further than sort of like a Google Doc. But um, but yeah, it it felt like when I when you could see the things that other people were doing, almost working within the constraints of that kind of um, OSR style, actually kind of I felt like that made me be a bit more creative, and it made me design a better game because I was more focused rather than trying to make the next fantasy game that's going to appeal to everyone. And when you started in on uh, Into the Odd, what kind of time frame was that for you as far as you developed some philosophies on game design and, you know, you're bouncing ideas off everybody else? And how did that kind of kernel grow into Into the Odd? So it started, it was 2011, I think, when I first kind of posted on my blog. I was, I said, I've got an idea for an RPG. I'm going to I'm going to try and make my D and D hack because that's what it started out as. I said, I'm, "This is going to be a D and D hack." Because at the time, everyone on Google Plus was playing like their version of basic D and D, so I didn't want to, <laughs> I didn't want to scare away all my potential players. So I was like, "I was like, how far can I push this while getting people who want to play D and D to still play it?" Um, and so around 2011, I said, "Right, I'm going to here, here's what I want to change. I want I knew that I wanted to have a bit more of a focus on like horror." I had this idea for like putting some sci-fi elements in there rather than like classic fantasy magic. Um, and it just kind of, the benefit of that Google Plus community was that you could always find players. And it was just something that I was just constantly playing and testing with people. And um, it just kind of organically kind of grew over the next few years. And I don't know when we, when I got in touch with Paolo at Lost Pages or he got, he got in touch with me, sorry. Um, but it was, um, it was 2014 when we then did a print version of Into the Odd. Um, so yeah, sort of three three years from kind of idea to uh, admittedly quite small book. <laughs> and through that, when you were developing it, I know that, uh, you know, your ICI doctrine is uh, like really foundational to a lot of people's philosophies on how to run games nowadays. And you also have like this kind of premise of like the distillation of a game down to its core elements and can you just talk did that come with into the odd or like how how did you juggle that kind of idea well the 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 sort of ICI thing which is like information choice impact I sort of arrived at each of those parts separately before I realized they would form like a sequence of play so I had this I, I a lot of these ideas are things that I'd read on a blog somewhere and someone had posted it like kind of maybe half baked and then um, either they didn't want to do anything with it, they kind of forgot about it and I latched onto it. So um, I can't remember where, but I definitely read somewhere someone talked about um, the idea of rather than rolling a search roll to find a trap, just tell the players they, they spot the trap if they look for it. And that's something that really resonated with me. So I, I made sure right, I'm going to put that in into the odd as kind of a, a rule, like you will find a trap if you look for it. Um, and then it, it sort of it spiraled out from there. So from that, I, it, I sort of applied the same idea to like clues. And it, I, I sort of eventually sort of realized, well, if players want the information about something and they ask the right questions and they they not even ask the right questions, but if they if they take action to investigate, I should give them information because it's what they're deciding to do. Um, and it was the same with the other two. Like, so choice was kind of like mainly from playing games where it felt like you just don't have a choice. You the, the the GM would give you lots of information and say, here's the current situation, but it would feel like you only really had one thing you could do. And, um, and again, same with the impact to the sort of the third phase was like a lot of times I've played a game where you, you think you're making a decision and then you realize it didn't really do anything. Um, 
and it extends from everything from sort of combat where you sort of roll a miss and it's like oh well that was that was low impact <laughs> or you make a decision and it just doesn't matter like you say oh well i want to i want to do this and then the gm kind of doesn't let it have an impact they sort of move things back onto the onto the railroad if you like um and yeah and then the, i sort of realized that well giving information the players make a choice and then the choice has impact is kind of like everything that i like about a game when it works well um so it became this kind of um yeah i, I quite like as you probably realize I quite like having lists of three things to help me remember because my brain can remember three things in order well, so and that, getting it down to three was uh was useful for me and i think i've seen uh, in previous interviews of yours that you mentioned that you used to be a uh, teacher and i know uh, yeah, like yeah. you know information design uh, often says well, okay do things in threes or like fives or like you know yeah, kind of odd numbers yeah. uh, type of thing so how much did that kind of play into sort of your information design and sharing of uh, information so I think one of the first posts that I wrote on my blog in sort of 2010 was um, was comparing. So that was when I was doing my teacher training, I think. And I was comparing like um, the, the things I was learning about, like teaching theory. And I was saying, well, could these also apply to role playing games? Which probably tells you that it wasn't great, that I, I probably wasn't suited to be a teacher if I'm sat in the teacher training thinking, how can I apply this to my uh, RPG when I get home? Um, and uh, and yeah, th th there's quite a lot because because like you say, so much of it is about holding a group's attention and not overloading them and they, that you want them to leave sort of energized and satisfied and feeling like they've got agency um yeah there's a lot of crossover i think i think there's a there's a reason why you see these people like ben milton who um who have a lot of really good things to say about how to run a game and just they just happen to be teachers as well i think i think there's a lot of crossover and the uh other thing that i was curious about is you know, Into the Odd, like you said, it started off as kind of like like a horror survivalist uh, kind of game. Were you mm. surprised at how well it was received? Like, you know, it wasn't in the, you know, fantasy genre <clears throat> per se, and but it really took off as far as everybody really liking the, the rule set and just the way it played at the table. Yeah, I mean, I was massively surprised at how much people liked the rules. Um, the, the main thing that surprised me was because because I'd sort of seen from play tests that people said people said that they liked the rules when they played in the game. But obviously, you always take that with a pinch of salt because, you know, they were friends and stuff. So they're going to tell me that they like my game because they don't want to upset me. Um, <clears throat> but the other thing was um, the thing that really surprised me was that people were actually interested in the world as well. Because originally, like I say, it was kind of a DD and d hack. And I, I, I had a very loose idea to put like a few little setting elements in there just to kind of tease a greater world. But the idea was it was going to be a game that you can go and you can run the Tomb of Horrors using this game or whatever. Um, so then people started to like respond to the blog post I was writing about the world, about sort of this, the Into the Odd Bastion Land world. And that's the bit that surprised me because that's the thing that you don't expect people to ever care about. You know, it's the classic, like the players sit down, they don't want to hear about your world. They just want to, to get in on it. And, um, and yeah, that, that was probably the, the biggest surprise rather than the actual game itself, um, which I, I won't jump ahead, but that kind of that kind of leads into the idea behind Electric Bastion and the idea that people did want to sort of see more of the world. Yeah, well, I mean, we can jump right into that because that's like an obvious transition <laughs> to when when you had the success and you saw the popularity of it and when did you go, OK, like maybe I should expand the world. Like you said, you, people were showing interest, but when did you actually sit down and go, I'm going to advance this? Well, the th I, I, after, after that book was successful, we, I kind of spoke about, I spoke with a few people about ideas for like what to do next, if people want to do something else. And um, there were all sorts of ideas. I, I was talking with, um, with Paolo at Lost Pages about, for a while we were talking about doing something that was like, it's a really stupid idea in retrospect, but it was kind of kind of cool at the time. Was doing something that came on like like proper broadsheet newspaper paper, so just doing like some Bastion Gazette type sort of like just full of like plot hooks or things like that. Um, and I, I knew that I wanted to do something, but I didn't want to just do like a supplement because for a while I just had like a document called Into the Odd Toolkit or something, and I was kind of putting stuff in there, but it felt like I was just writing stuff because I should rather than I was writing stuff that I actually wanted. So I sort of took a step back and just decided to just run the game for a while and see what I actually wanted to do. Uh, what Sorry, what I actually needed to run the game and what, 
what the players were kind of what it felt like the players wanted if they, if they wanted more what do they actually want um so yeah it, it kind of had the idea of doing individual books for like the different elements of the world so like bastion the city and the underground and deep country but then um the the main thing that i felt people wanted was was more of the world but there were things about into the other people really latched onto so this idea of the starter packages uh people really liked using those as a way to kind of impart the setting so they people would always say oh i think it's really cool that when you roll your character if you get someone that's got some cigars and a harpoon gun it it, it set it, get, it gets you excited about that character and it tells you something about the world without having to sit and read like an explanation of like what this character class is or something like that so um so yeah, then it kind of started as like a really stupid idea where I was like, well, what if I could do a hundred of these starter packages and each one was like a, a full page and had sort of sub options within it. So I think I made a, made a document that had these 100 sort of blank pages all laid out and just sort of started started trying to fill them in. And it just kind of, it went from there. The, the idea that you could have a world that's presented through player characters rather than sort of big pages full of text explaining the world that that was kind of when I sort of got that idea that was when I kind of first got a vision for what electric bastion would actually look like as a book I think uh the page count of your the rule system itself is like 22 23 pages of rules and a lot of the uh failed careers of the uh characters and when you said 100 did you ever at like 50 go okay that's gonna be good enough like because that's a lot of (laughs) random tables and yeah. those types of like details are actually very difficult to create did you ever kind of go i need to pull this up there's the, or did you just go i need 100 and that's what i'm gonna do well i i knew that i wanted to use a similar system to into the odd where you roll your ability scores and that kind of gives you your um that gives you your like starter package but i also knew that i also wanted to have that kind of secondary option for people who wanted a bit more random that they could just roll a random career whether it's for a non-player character or if they just wanted to mix things up a bit um so i knew that i was limited by dice essentially um so i thought i could do i could do d66 which would mean like 36 results but that doesn't feel like very many um and i was ju- i was saying some- someone to about this this week i was saying that there needs to be something in between <laughs> they need like a 60 sided <laughs> die to become really common because that would be great to be able to just write 60 but the, the fact that i had to write 100 um actually sorry for full transparency i only wrote 94 uh because i got guest writers for the initial um six at the end um and then some extra writers later on um but writing 94 meant that it meant that you had to push yourself out of your comfort zone and you had to get you had to go with ideas that you might have initially kind of rejected and thought no that's too silly and then you kind of have to put it in there and you have to dig really deep when you're trying to come up with these items um that the because the characters are very much defined by their equipment so there was a lot of reading like lists like hardware store um like lists and just like just like weird old like items that people would find in like vintage shops and things like that. Um, so yeah, it, 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 it forced me to dig deep, which is probably a good thing. And I mean, through those uh, descriptions, it really is evocative of the uh, Electric Bastion Land world. And like, and I think it, it's a kickstart for a lot of people. And for those that don't uh, have the game um, handy or haven't seen it before, like as you read through some of these like odd names and evocative uh, language about uh, what the characters do in this world, and the fact that they are failed at whatever they were trying to do, and uh, and now they are a collective group that are sharing a debt. And to tell us how you kind of came up with that concept of like a shared debt to combine different players. Yeah. So. Out of everything I've written, I think the shared debt is probably like the most useful. I, again, I, I, I'm not for a minute claiming that I invented this out of thin air. I must have stolen this from somewhere, but I can't remember exactly where. But the, the idea, I mean, I think I think Traveller often starts with like players in, at least they have, they have like a mortgage on the ship, don't they, or something. So it's not a new idea, but I really wanted to make it central that that you would start with this pressure because in, in Into the Odd, it's I, I started characters in Into the Odd, it just says, 
uh, for whatever reason, basically, you've decided to become a treasure hunter and um, you're going to go out, try and get rich and try not to die, um, which is fine. And it's it's very much to the point, but it does require players to kind of buy into that. Um, whereas it, it, if you put that debt on them straight away, they know that they've got to find a way to pay it off. And it's sort of, I think I, I already had these um, starter packages listed as like backgrounds, but then having the debt and tying it to the idea that it's a failed career, um, it worked nicely because those two things work together. So it's you, you, you don't have the option to just, well, I'm going to work really hard at my job and save up and pay off my debt because you don't have a job anymore. Um, it, it works really well in that sense. Um, it sets a nice tone as well because it's people always respond surprisingly well to me, like telling them that their character is a failure straight away. Um, I didn't want them to be like weak characters and I didn't want them to be like ineffective, like they can't do anything in the world. But there's something about saying like, look, you are all going to be losers to start with. Like <laughs> this is, you're going to start kind of at, at the worst point in your life probably. And it's it's only going to, um, hopefully only going to go up from here. Um, but yeah, it's the shared debt. It's one of those things where now when I play a game and I don't have that initial kind of pressure, I, I have to put something else in there as well because I've kind of, I find it so useful just to be able to like light a fire under the players and say, you know, this this is the situation you've kind of, you, you've got this uh, this thing chasing you to get your debt. Well, and you solve a lot of problems between the uh, backgrounds or the, the failed careers and the uh, shared debt because that's always, I think, one of the most difficult things for a GM is like, okay, how do I get this adventure started? And you're like, okay, like in D&D &D terms, you'd go to the tavern and rumors or, you know, you hope for some plot hooks there, but yours is able to hit the ground running, essentially, because you have a character in hand with some evocative language and some unique items. Um, do you have a, a unique item favorite of yours that you go, I was really happy with uh, this decision? <laughs> Funnily enough, I was reading that because it's been so long since I actually, because I wrote uh, that obviously that the failed careers were the thing that took the longest time to write. So I had the rules done. The rules are basically the same as Into the Yard. I had them done pretty early on and I was making small changes and I had a lot of the guidance kind of written as well. So for a long period of time, so this is when I was still working my, my day job at the time. So for a long time, I was just trying to like grind through these careers. Like whenever I got a chance, I'd do like one or two here or there on an evening and always going back and sort of editing them, making sure there weren't too many duplicate items because I only have a, a finite imagination, it turns out. Um, but it's been so long that I just, I, I forget that most of them exist. So it, it's really fun to look through them again, even now. And the one that someone mentioned to me recently in a play report, um, I think it was in the Discord uh, server that I have, um, they said that they had their the failed career was the amateur dramatist and they had a show pig. Um, and there's a lot of like weird animals in there. So I, I, I like that you're very likely to end up with like a weird pet that has, that it isn't, isn't just a pig, it's like a show pig. So it's going to be like a fussy <laughs> pig um, that needs looking after. And it's kind of useless, but people always respond well to having those kind of pets. It's like the small but vicious dog in in Warhammer Fantasy roleplay. So um, I think the sheer amount of pets is is one of the things that I'm most sort of proud of in there. And the other one of the other favorites that I've seen, at least, is Mockeries, um, which are essentially Muppets. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I, how did you come up with the idea for that? And like, did you at any point go like, boy, this is too much. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't fit within the game world, but maybe it does. Yeah, so I still can't really believe that I actually went through with that because it's definitely a strange fit. Um, but so the, the initial idea kind of came from, um, it was just like one of these stupid conversations where every like Christmas, like I'd watch like the Muppet Christmas Carol. And it's like this weird world because I would think like, well, hang on, there's these like pigs and people walking around, but then there's also, they're eating turkey at the end. So it's one of these silly conversations where you're like, how does this world function? Do, do, do these, do the humans and the Muppets know that they're different, like in this weird Dickensian Muppet world? And it just kind of started as like a silly thought experiment. And I think I, I wrote like a blog post about it as like, oh, this isn't like canon, but here's a weird idea. Like what if there were these 
uh, sort of felt animals brought to life that live in Bastion and they, they kind of live like humans. Um, and then I think, I, I can't remember what point I decided I was going to put it in the book, but it, it certainly didn't start as something I was going to put in there. But the, the thing is, other than some like guest contributors, um, I've always kind of written Into the Yard and Electric Bastion and we're both like all written by me. Um, and I think I always like books that you can sort of tell they were written by one person and they're one person's kind of vision at the risk of sounding self-important. And it felt like something that was very like authentic to my sense of humor and my kind of idea of what is like an interesting th thing to explore. So um, I sort of at some point I just bit the bullet and said, no, I'm, I'm putting them in. And it's it's a strange fit, but it feels very me and it feels very kind of authentic. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm putting it in there. Oh, I, I really like it. And I, I've always actually wondered about that when there it's almost like cannibalism where you're watching these, uh, you know, Muppets eating yeah, yeah. You know, the turkey at the end and you're kind of confused <laughs> by it as a kid. You're like, it's actually a little bit disturbing, but uh, you go with <laughs> exactly, it. Yeah. Um, as far as the, like the setting goes, and I think you kind of cracked a nut for what a lot of people have troubles with as far as when when you make a setting or a world like you go okay like this is the npc that runs this store and then this is like the mayor of the town and like this is the doors that you go through and like a ton of detail whereas you seem to be able to provide enough breathing room for the gm to operate um but also giving enough depth so that people knew the kind of city that they were in and did you know that you were always going to do that right away or did that kind of evolve over time so quite early on, I, I did have kind of in sort of a very early version of Into the Art, I had like a page of setting, um, most of which did kind of make it into, a, into the book. There is like a page for like setting material in that original book. Um, but then pretty early on, I sort of thought, well, uh, how much of this could I, how much of this setting can I get across to the players without telling them about it? So they don't have to sit and read this page. They just kind of absorb it by creating a character and by um looking at like the equipment lists and just kind of discovering the world kind of organically um so part of that came from like it's the, this idea i can't remember where i read it it's it's this idea of sort of flavor over law so rather than saying here are some here are the million truths about this world just kind of giving everything a flavor so people kind of eventually just get it and they sort of they realize well this is a thing that will fit in this setting even though i haven't been told this, this thing exists in this setting, it feels like it fits in Bastionland. And um, yeah, I wanted, to, I wanted to kind of get people to that point where they, they knew the flavor, even if they didn't necessarily know everything about the world. Um, and I think part of what makes that work as well is it's that kind of distillation again, where originally there were like lots of different cities and lots of different regions of the world. And like, there was even a map and everything like that. Uh, but eventually I just sort of thought, well, if I can just put all of the city stuff in one place and if I can put all of the dungeon stuff in one place and all of the countryside stuff in one place, then it's people will just, you kind of, you kind of create an interesting place anyway, because it's an interesting idea to think, well, what if there was only one huge city, but also it just means that it's only, it's one thing for people to kind of latch onto and they don't have to learn about the, you know, the classic thing of like when you're reading about a new RPG setting and you're reading about all the different lands and things like that. And, a part of me does enjoy that, but I always have that moment when I'm like, I don't fully understand how these places are all different and like they all <laughs> kind of turn into one in your head. Um, so yeah, I, I wanted to give people the freedom to make their own stuff within the kind of the few kind of canonical areas that exist in the world. And can you just kind of elaborate on those uh, areas just to kind of give people a sense of the game setting, just yeah. where they can go? So um, there's kind of, well, there's, there's kind of four, but there's only three that are really sort of, I'll, I'll do all four. Um, so Bastion is like the only city that matters. It's a big, huge city that it kind of, originally there were multiple cities and the, the gimmick with Bastion was that it was like the modern city. It was the place where like all the industry was happening. So there is still some of that, but then it kind of like, in, in both the kind of setting and in my development of the game, it absorbed the other cities. So it like absorbed the city that was all about kind of weird, um, like cosmic stuff. And it absorbed the city that was kind of more about like bureaucracy and like, um, 
um, like kind of like paranoia and things like that. And, um, and yeah, so essentially it's a city that's too big to map. If you can think of something, it's there, everything's complicated, everything's kind of shared and it's rather than trying to be like a specific city. So rather than trying to be like say London in 1920, it's, it's, it's trying to be like the idea of a city. So part of the brief that I gave to Alec, who did the art, was that it should look like it should look like the way that somebody describes a huge city if they've never been to one before, and they spent like one day in Tokyo or New or Manhattan, and then they went back to their sort of extremely rural environment. How would they describe the city? And that's how it should feel. Um, and then everything outside of Bastion is deep country. Um, so. I'm someone who's lived in both a city and I grew up in a rural environment. Um, and whenever I sort of go back to where I grew up, it, it kind of feels like going back in time. So I wanted to kind of take that to almost make that real. So as you go further away from Bastion, it's almost literally like going back in time. Um, and everything's kind of inconvenient and difficult and everything feels kind of small. Um, the, the, the people in the places feel small, but the kind of the landscape is very big. Um, and then you've got the underground, which exists underneath everything else. And it's kind of an excuse to be able to connect any two places in the world and also just insert a dungeon because you know, the underground is always kind of shifting. It doesn't, it kind of exists outside of time and space. So if you want a dungeon to suddenly appear underneath this apartment block in Bastion, you can do it because the underground conveniently for the GM doesn't follow all the rules. Um, and then the kind of fourth one is this idea of the living stars, which is kind of the the source of weirdness in the world. It's this uh, the idea that it's the place where kind of weird like alien technology might come from. And a lot of the kind of cults and religion are based around the stars. Um, so, yeah, I, I wanted to try and create a few, I guess, like three regions that you could kind of slot anything into. So if you had an idea, you could find somewhere to fit it within this world. And so now you've got this uh, book that's wildly successful to the point where uh, you were convinced to do a uh, itch uh, game jam uh, by a, a bunch of folks. And uh, I think yeah. I interviewed uh, Yohai uh, about him trying to convince you to do it. And from that, uh, I think there were 61 entries, if I'm getting this right, including uh, Yohai did one, um, Jason uh, Tochi uh, did one and uh cosmic orrery and uh, jim parkin that did weird north in it as mm. part of it and we'll maybe talk about how that also inspired uh, uh yohai and later um in his karen game but ha did you have any idea that uh so many people would like and latch on to the rules and take that nugget that you've provided and just grow with it like uh what I would actually consider, I was, I was trying to think of the right analogy. It's almost like Elvis Costello or uh, in Canada, I'm from Canada. So there's like Leonard Cohen, where you are a game designer's designer. I think people yeah, yeah. see your stuff and they go, I, that's, it's so inspiring to me that I can build off of it. Well, I didn't expect it, of, of course. Like I think um, at the time I didn't, but I've since had some time to kind of look back on it and I, I'm still like amazed that anybody wants to like do anything with it. But then I've, I've sort of tried to look back on it and think, well, but what, why has it like resonated with, with some people? And um, the thing is, I've always designed games for myself. So most of my ideas for a game start with my dissatisfaction with another game. So I'll either read a new RPG or I'll play a game and I'll think, oh, that, that could have been really good, but I'm not happy with this and this and this. Um, so I, I literally make the game that I want to exist. And I think when you do that and you stick to it and you don't try and make something that's going to appeal to everyone, um, the people that it does resonate with, if you find like like-minded people will find it and it will click with them. Um, even if it doesn't become, you know, a, a million seller, um, the people that it does click with, it'll it'll click really well. Um, and it's not going to be everyone's favorite game, not going to replace D&D. &D, but um, but I yeah, I, I, I get people that read Electric Bastion or Into the Yard and they say that it does something that they felt was missing from other role playing games, which is exactly what I kind of wanted uh, for myself. Um, 
so yeah i think i think that's the thing i think the fact that i've been very selfish has uh very luckily worked out to <laughs> reach out to other people <laughs> as well <laughs> Well, and it went on to, uh, so uh, as I was kind of doing that chain, um, Jim Parkins' uh, Weird North, uh, Yohai was able to turn that into Cairn. And then Ben Milton, who you mentioned earlier, turned uh, into the odd, into Maze Rats, and all inspired. And now, you know, Ben's gone on to take elements of that into the Nave. And uh, like, you can just see that kind of progression going along and at the at the fundamental piece of it is into the odd and so recently you did uh into the odd advanced i'm teasing you because i know it's remastered <laughs> <laughs> but into the odd remastered um and when you this when did you decide to do that as far as uh was it based upon so many other people uh working with it um and you felt you wanted to kind of clean things up yeah so to, to be honest with you, my, it, it wasn't, so let me start again. So the, the, when I wrote Electric Bastion Land, in my head, that was not necessarily going to replace Electric Bastion Land. I, uh, sorry, not going to replace Into the Odd. Like I knew that Into the Odd was still going to be a thing that existed. But in terms of like what I wanted it for, it was kind of replacing Into the Odd because it, it was kind of the next step of, of my sort of what I wanted Into the Odd to be. Um, but yeah, I, I was very surprised when after that came out, there were still people saying, oh, well, you know, I, I like Electric Bastion and it's good, but I, I still kind of prefer Into the Odd. And I really made the effort to like think, well, wh why do people still prefer this? And there's lots of reasons which I've kind of gone into before, but I think um, after, after exploring all that, I kind of thought, well, if I want to keep Into the Odd, if Into the Odd is still going to be a thing that people go to as their main game rather than just a sort of a stepping stone to electric bastion land um i wanted it to be something i wanted to kind of make it the best version of what it could be and um i'm immensely proud of what i did with the first version with lost pages and you know it was the first thing that i've ever released as like a, a thing people could buy so i um, i was very proud of that but i sort of looked at it next to electric bastion and then i thought oh we can we can do something a bit more interesting with this now I've got a bit more sort of resources and things like that um so I knew that I didn't want to do a revision or like a new edition because that was kind of already what I'd done with Electric Bastion Land um so I thought um do a remaster so the, the best possible version of the original um with you know a more luxurious package um perhaps a little bit more um more more visually appealing and just kind of expanding in places that wouldn't change the core too much. So things like expanding the sample adventure. And there are a few little rules that got taken over from Electric Bastion, but they're just kind of little optional rules, really. Um, <clears throat> so I'd done some work with Free League before on uh, Forbidden Lands, uh, their Kickstarter. I did like a stretch goal for them. Sorry, let me clear my throat. That's all right. <clears throat> Forbidden Lands is an awesome little game, a hex crawl, and it has an OSR style of uh, feel to it, at least. Uh, if, although yeah. the yeah, and, are... and with that one, they they sort of sought out OSR people to to come on board. So they got like Ben Milton and Patrick Stewart mm -hmm. and some other people to to come on and do that. Um, but yeah, so sorry, I'd, I'd worked with them on that, and um, in that sort of conversation, they'd um so, so nils who works there and he, he'd said oh you know we're all big fans of into the odd at um at free league and i kind of thought oh yeah sure this is like the, the this is like the schmoozing talk um and then he sort of talked about it a bit and i'm like oh he actually has played it and he does he does know it um so we kind of chatted on and off a little bit and it kind of reached a point where um where because i'd i reached this point where i knew i wanted to do a a remaster i thought well freely could be an interesting one to work with um and at the time I'd, I'd i'd already i'd kind of been connecting with johan who did um johan Noor, who did um Mortborg and obviously a, an incredibly like visually exciting book um so i thought if we could if i could work with johan and do it through freely that might be an interesting way of doing it and um yeah, I, I asked Johan thinking he were, he'll be so busy now because he just won all the Ennies for Mortborg, <laughs> beating Electric Bastion and so I was still very angry with him. And um, I, I thought he's going to be so busy. And um, luckily, 
he was very busy, but he said he wanted to do it because again, he'd, he, he'd enjoyed it into the art the first time round. So he managed to squeeze it in and, um, and yeah, and then it kind of went from there. It felt like a good, felt like a good fit to be doing it as a collaboration with, with Johan and working with, with free league to handle. So, so that we could make it a little bit more, um, luxurious in terms of the, the, the package, uh, than what I could sort of manage on my own. I guess from like an independent game designer, how is that as far as like you have your baby and you're now trusting somebody outside of your kind of control to do things that even though obviously free league has a great reputation and um, is producing amazing games, but was that a difficult decision for you? Obviously, are you, I assume you're maintaining your IP on it, so to speak. Yeah. So that's the thing. I mean, it's, it's a slightly complex arrangement with free league because it's not sort of, they're basically handling the printing and the distribution. So it's still got Bastion and Press on it. Uh, it's with Free League. But um, I, yeah, I wouldn't have wanted to do it where I was sort of giving the text to a developer and a publisher, and then they went off and made it. Um, so essentially, between me and Johan, we we made the whole thing, basically. Um, Johan did all of the art, all of the layout, and all of the, all of the text was me. Um, and to be honest, um, Free League were kind of just like, do do what you want to do really um once i ran the initial concept by them i don't think they gave me any notes like other than things like the position of the barcode on the back and the isbn number and, and a lot of sort of boring details like that i don't think they gave any sort of uh sort of notes which is which is a perfect arrangement really because I, I did want to preserve that feel that it's this is like it's kind of a personal thing in some ways i, I definitely wanted to preserve that and now that, uh, I mean, the Kickstarter was successful, I think you had over 4,000 backers, over, I think, 150,000 US dollars uh, was raised through it. And now you're doing game design full time. Did you ever think from the G plus days when you were like posting things and, you know, uh, people were banding things about that you would ever have gotten to this point? And like when you started, was that a hope or was it just like an evolution of what happened? Not at all. I mean, when, when we launched into the yard, I remember Paolo um, messaging me like the evening that we launched it. And um, the messages were just like, we've sold 12 copies. Um, and I was like, whoa, 12. And then it, the next message would be like the next day, it'd be like, we're up to 20 copies, um, which at the time was like, I couldn't imagine that like 20 people wanted to buy the game. Um, um, but no, it was, it, it was not something I had imagined I would be able to do. It was kind of the, it was kind of a fortunate timing because I was the, the day job I was working with at the time of the electric bastion and Kickstarter, um, that was kind of coming to a close or at least like a coming to a crossroads basically where I could either stay doing that, or it was kind of a, a contract was like coming to an end things like that. So I, I thought, well, I'll, I'll see how the Kickstarter goes and it was much more successful than I imagined and I sort of ran the numbers on it and thought, well, that there's enough here that I could try. Initially I thought, well, I could try just dropping down to four days a week at my day job and I could spend one day a week doing RPG stuff, which, which probably would have been sensible. Um, but then we kind of ran the numbers on it and we thought, well, we could probably try it for a year and then see how it looks after a year. So I'm at the moment, I'm still doing it and things are still looking good. Uh, but I am, yeah, I'm very grateful that I'm able to do it. And it's, it's because of the sort of the, the amount of people that j jumped onto the crowdfunding campaigns, uh, that it's been possible. So, um, I'm taking it one year at a time, but yeah, it, it's not something I could have ever like imagined when I was doing those first editions, uh, no way. And, and so, uh, you're designing full time now, and what does that kind of look like? I know you've got um, as the stars in uh, the doomed um, games that you've I've seen on your posts on your blog, and uh, but do you have like a big project kind of lined up in your head that you're working on, um, or is that still top secret? You don't have to give too many details, but no, I'm no, I can, curious. I can, I can. That there's nothing too secret at the moment. Um, it's 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 been a real it's because it's, it's been two years now. And for that, for that first sort of, maybe even the first six months, I was still very much in the headspace of, from my day job thinking, um, you kind of, it has to be very much Monday to Friday, nine to five. Um, you have to constantly be writing and I don't know how other designers find it, but I, I found that you can't write nine to five. <laughs> you can't create 
um, eight hours a day. You have to be, you have to do other things to make the writing happen. Um, but um, so, so I got more into the flow after that. And the the, the, the projects at the moment that I'm doing, I've just finished. Um, so at the start of last year, I um, started working on a, a miniatures game. Um, mainly because during the first lockdown, I sort of was looking for anything to do. So I, um, for the first time in maybe 20 years, I bought some miniatures and did some painting. And um, and obviously I was massively dissatisfied with all the miniatures rule sets out there. So I thought I'll make a miniatures rule set and see how simple I can make it and things like that. And that, that kind of grew into this thing that is now called The Doomed. Um, for a while, the project was called Grimlight but I don't want to get sued. So it's called the doomed. Um, and that's, that's something I've been working on a lot at the moment. And that, that has now reached a point where I've kind of passed it on to someone else to, uh, to, to finish. Um, uh, I, I haven't told people who I'm publishing it with yet, but it's, it's going to be going through another publisher and um, someone who's a bit more experienced in the miniatures uh, side of things. So it's that that's going to be happening soon. Um, but other than that, yeah, it's, I'm very good at starting projects, as you've probably realized. So little side projects like Ask the Stars, which is just like a weird kind of very rules-like kind of Oracle system, um, things like that. Uh, when I'm working on them, I'm always kind of thinking, is this a waste of time? Because this is probably not going to be something that's going to be the next into the Ardor Electric Bastion then. But often I'll find those projects help me work through ideas that sometimes turn into something else or in doing that i find out what i don't want to do <laughs> things like that so they, they do help so i am also working on um things that are a bit more sort of closely tied to like bastion land or into the odd um so yeah i, I can't say much more but i've got um i've got yeah i've got i've got some idea I'm, I'm not finished with bastion land for sure um and when i uh look at your blog, one of the things that I really, really appreciate is just your game design philosophy. And, you know, going back to you, you are a designer's designer, where like you read your content and you're like, oh, okay, you're trying to still lay out some game design concepts. And uh, I appreciated one post in particular, God, I think it was maybe a year ago, that you found like an old game book in a thrift store or something like that. And you you took it and yeah. you analyzed games in general. And um, do you find your mind is always in that space where you're you're looking at everything and how to gamify it or how to simplify it or distill it down to yeah, something? It, definitely. I mean, there's a time when I would have tried to pretend it's not because I should be concentrating on other things. But now that I'm allowed to think about that all the time, <laughs> it's, um, it's it's a relief to be able to just allow my brain to do that because yeah it's it's just one of those things where like I said when I was doing my teacher training I couldn't help but think how can this become um how can I turn this into an RPG um and yeah when, when I was sort of planning my classes they would always include some kind of silly little five minute game at the start as like a kind of starter activity um so yeah there's some there's definitely something in me that wants to explore the kind of the idea of games and what, what makes a game fun and especially at that kind of simpler end because believe it or not I, I do read a lot of rules but I get very easily sort of overwhelmed if a rule set is like complicated to me um so things like yeah I think well I've done a few posts based on sort of old game books I found but I think it was the one with like old party games from yeah, like the yeah. 1950s or something yeah. like I always think that's interesting because it's got to be something that you can bring out at a party so I was I always hope there's going to be like a hidden gem in there. I don't think there was much in the way of a hidden gem in, the, in those books. Um, they were entertaining reading, but um, but yeah, I it, it's always something that's uh, sort of ticking away in my head for sure. And what excites you in today's game world, like in the OSR or NSR space? Like what what are you seeing out there that you go, this is really interesting and people are like taking concepts in a, in a new space or even a setting or just the design feature. Yeah. So I was thinking about this and the, the games that have got me really excited over the last sort of last sort of six months or so, are really ones that feel like a sort of, like I said, like a passion project of one person where you can almost like hear their voice in it. And um, <clears throat> it feels like, someone is really trying to make a game that does something that they've never quite been able to do with with other games 
um, as a kind of contrast to these games where sometimes you'll sometimes you'll read through a 300 page book and you'll think I, I don't know what this person wants me to do with this game like it's very thorough but I don't know what they want me to do but um there's there's there seems to be like a certain subset of games at the moment that are about having a very simple um very simple set of rules and then focusing on making sure the GM knows what to do with it so there's things like Scorn by Sam Dobler um, Any Planet is Earth by Jim Parkin, and especially the 2400 games by Jason Tocci. Um, those games are all very simple, but it feels like it feels like for a long time, sim- I, I would I would read simple games and think, oh yeah, th- that's really cleverly designed, but I don't know what to do with it. But these are simple games that then go on to tell you, well, here's how you actually play this game properly, and here's how you actually run it, and here are some ideas for for what to do with it. Um, so yeah, that those are the ones that have been grabbing me at the moment, which is, which is great as well, because um, it, it's much easier to print out a sort of four page uh, game than, uh, than deal with giant, giant stacks of uh, RPG books. So <laughs> that's good for me. Well, that's, uh, I really appreciate, uh, you know, you sharing some of your knowledge and wisdom today. And to close out here, Mark of the Odd, Tell us a little bit about how, if people are interested in using Into the Odd mechanics, uh, what they can do to um, implement those in their own game. Yeah, so um, so basically the the core rules of Into the Odd are, are free to use as, as long as you follow the, the guidelines in Mark of the Odd. Um, if you go to bastionand.com, there's a link to Mark of the Odd on there. Um, and yeah, basically it's the, the core rules of the game uh, things like the starter packages, um, the, the the sort of the template for the starter packages and things like that. So it's if you're looking for like a core of the game to use, because I, I always think it's used. People, one of the things that people ask about is like um, that they want to make a game for a particular purpose, and they either whether whether to start from scratch or whether to like hack an existing system. And I, I would always kind of advise people to hack an existing system to begin with. Because otherwise you can kind of get bogged down in the weeds like reinventing the wheel um so if you're looking for a very streamlined um sort of core for the game uh mark mark of the odd is something you can do that's a terrible advert i'm, I'm re- i i should prepare a proper sort of advertisement well, I, well, speech I, I think it's uh it, it's great but it, i was actually going to ask you did it catch you off guard when so many people started using into the odd and did you went okay how do i share that um th- through mark of the odd did, did you yeah well for a long time people would kind of ask me and i would say like that's fine i was like it would just be a thing where someone would message me and say i really want to use into the odd and i would just say to them like because you know obviously you can't copyright game mechanics so i would just say to them like yeah te- i mean technically you don't need to ask me as long as you're not using specific text from the game so i would say you know it's it would it, be nice if you credited me as like a or you, you want to give a link to Into the Odd in there as an inspiration, but yeah, d- do what you want. But the thing is, I think people took that to mean people focused in on me saying you can't use the specific text, and then got very scared that I would sue them if they released their book and it was too close. <laughs> so I thought we need a more we need a more structured system um, to actually make it work. And it, it took quite a long time to hammer it out, but um, but yeah, it's 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 very straightforward, and I, I want people to be able to. Um, I want people to be able to do it because I think people get very precious about their kind of rules. Um, but it's in, in my experience, I don't think that those rules are necessarily what make into the odd what it is. So I'm not worried that someone's going to replace into the odd just by using the same core of rules. Um, they'll make their own game with it, which is going to be completely different. Um, and you know, it's, it's just basically making someone's life slightly easier to use, uh, a sort of pre-made system um but no it's i mean I'm, I'm excited to see as more and more sort of systems come through with that and you have a uh, patreon um as well that people can uh, subscribe to yeah so the patreon is for the um the, the podcast which i do sort of a couple of series a year and um and the the, the streams which i do again on and off and all the, and the blog posts that i do at bastianand.com so the patreon is patreon.com forward slash bastianand but but for all the links to all these things uh bastianand.com is the place to go great and well i'll make sure that all the uh links and details are in the show notes and uh 
okay, and cool. try to um, you know let people know a little bit more. Not that that's a problem with your uh, your work at this point. I think it's pretty popular. So, but I'll keep adding to it. Always but, always helps to get more uh, out there. <laughs> Well, uh, Chris, I really want to thank you for uh, joining me today. Appreciate uh, you know sharing uh, some of your wisdom and knowledge that you've uh, gained over the years and uh, your process. And uh, I'm sure a lot of uh, designers out there are going to be uh, um, learning from it. So thank you very much. Great. Thanks for having me.